Can I ask you all a question? Okay? Yeah. Now, here in this room, what do you see? You see yourselves, right? You see the projection, and you see the handsome me. Now, six hours from now, you'll still see yourselves, the projection, and the more handsome me. Why? Electricity. Something which is powering the lights, the projector, your laptops, your iPads, iPhones, everything. Now, um, we all understand the act of renewable energy versus non-renewable energy. And without jumping further into the science behind this, let us only understand the effects of using what we use currently. And that primarily consists of fossil fuels and petroleum. Well, where does our world currently stand? Global warming, also referred to as a slow cooking of our planet, but it's no more slow. Currently, it is responsible for the extinction of several species. Not only land animals, but water animals. Global warming has led to the disruption of our very important ecosystem. Further, there is pollution, leading to damage of people, trees, crops, wildlife, and bodies of water. Why? Because of these very non-renewable sources fossil fuel, and petroleum, which is harming us, other organisms, and the planet we so lovingly call Earth. So there's more to it. You see, our current reserves of oil, natural gas, and petroleum will all be running out in another 115 years. So what we depend on is depleting, and is depleting fast. But can we use renewable sources to solve the problem? Not really, because they depend on external factors such as water, sunlight, wind, making them unreliable and unfit for mainstream use. Basically, we're in a very big problem, which is concealed to you, the public. So what are we to do? Well, let's plan for a children's party and have fun. Seems unusual, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's the thing, because rather than thinking like smart scientists, you know, let's think like innocent kids. You know, what are kids fascinated by in parties? You know, um, for me, it's the cake. And you know, those bunch of colorful, mysterious flying balloons. And those balloons contain something very precious, helium. Not helium, actually, but helium-3. Not quite the stuff in balloons, but something very similar. Now, helium takes different forms. One of those forms is called helium-3, a light, non-radioactive isotope of helium with two protons and two neutrons, as seen. OK, well, this was the light coming on. OK, right. As seen by the diagram there. Now, again, whereas normal helium has two protons and two neutrons. Now, helium-3 is a gas at room temperature, and it's very rare even on Earth. But travel roughly 400,000 kilometers, and you would find 1,100,000 metric tons of helium-3 on the moon. How does it happen? Well, the sun's solar wind emits helium-3, which unfortunately does not arrive on Earth because of our strong magnetic field. But the moon's weak magnetic field allows this isotope to establish on the surface. Which is why, ladies and gentlemen, we, will be mining the moon. Seems unusual, yet yeah, it's really quite far-fetched, and it's not an easy feat to tackle. Helium-3 is buried under layers of lunar rock, and we would heat the lunar dust about 700 degrees Celsius before it converts into a more powdery substance in order for the gas to be released. We can do this by capturing sunlight reflected from a gathering dish to bake the soil. Again, as seen by the diagram there. And uh, moreover, the moon is an inhospitable place. Another challenge. But you know what? We, we can solve this. We do have the correct transportation, the advancement technology, and the correct people that can change this problem into a solution. Our concern is to generate energy from this. How do we do it? We'll take helium-3 and deuterium, which is very common on Earth, 
and fuse them together to form helium and a proton. Now, the very energy released from this reaction would in turn create heat. That heat would be able to turn water into steam. And then the force of the steam would be able to drive turbines that would produce the needed electricity. It's just that simple. But admittedly, I have left out some key points. Most prominent being the temperature, where the atoms would have to be fused at 150 million degrees Celsius, or 10 times the heat of the sun, to create a fourth stage of matter known as plasma, which would cause the atoms to fuse. But it's not an impossible task where um, ITR, known as, known as the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor Project, has overcome this challenge by magnets. That's right, magnets which created the needed temperature, as well as levitated the magnetic plasma so it would not come in contact with chamber walls. Now, ITR is funded by various countries and plans to establish a fusion reactor by 2020. But, you know, currently we already have nuclear power plants in place, right? Which don't fuse atoms, but rather fission them. Basically, instead of combining atoms, they separate atoms and, well, they separate uranium atoms, a radioactive substance, which is probably not the best approach. Why? Because using uranium for fission reaction as a resource can be dangerous. Having pressurized water, radioactive material, and a constant need for maintenance 24 hours a day is a dangerous concept. While helium-3 has no water to litter, no radioactive material left over to dump in landfills, and no potential threat of a meltdown that could result fatally. Helium-3 is our answer. Now, usually, mining isn't considered an environmentally friendly approach to our energy needs. So how can mining the moon be any different, right? Uh, it is. And it's more environmentally friendly than many other resources that we use. It also holds great economic potential. As we know it, this project is something very unique and innovative, and well, so is the price tag. Now, Gerald Kalinske, an engineer at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, has arrived to the conclusion that an estimated $800 million would be needed to bring back each ton of lunar helium-3. Keeping in mind that currently on Earth, the very little helium-3 we have is sold for $1,000 to $4,000 per gram for research purposes. This confidently suggests that helium-3 would sell for at least a billion dollars per ton, comparatively less to the $4.5 billion price tag many entrepreneurs and scientists convey. And simple maths justifies that the profit would be vast. Further, roughly 25 tons of helium-3 is enough to power the United States for a whole year. And by simple calculations, the United States will only pay between 25 to 112 billion dollars for their current annual energy needs, if they use the 25 tons of helium-3, compared to the rising 1.2 trillion dollars they spent in 2011 and 12. Just imagine that remaining money not spent on energy could very well educate and prevent poverty through the United States as well as the world. But who really cares? You know, it's the United States. What, 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 what benefit do we get being a country? What benefit does New Zealand get? You know, um, New Zealand gets the benefit by patenting the concept and then licensing this idea to countries in need, such as India, China, and the United States, receiving a royalty in return. That's how New Zealand benefits. So we understand this to be a viable, profitable, and noble business, but at the same time, it's providing great environmental effects. Simply, we're receiving clean energy with no radioactivity involved. There would be no carbon emissions, no air pollutions, and be intrinsically safe. The fusion reaction would be four million times more energetic than burning coal, oil, and gas. Only by mining the moon are we receiving a reliable and stable source of energy, 
without being dependent on depleting non-renewable sources. We would be able to decrease pollution, but also reverse global warming. New Zealand can commence this approach and initiate this action where various countries can and will contribute to make this a success. The potential of helium-3 outweighs any debate to continue mining fossil fuels for energy. Now, um, mining the moon is something very innovative, right? And what happens after helium-3 runs out? After all, it is non-renewable and will only last between 1,000 to 5,000 years. But you see, this allows us breathing space. The time frame gives the world an opportunity to create the perfect source of energy, whatever that may be. While at the same time, it helps us start afresh. Where after the source does end, we receive a world with very little pollution, a reverse trend in global warming, and a bright green future. Through collective thinking, not only by New Zealand, but also by everyone else, this idea can change the world. So why not change it by mining the moon? Uh, thank you. Um, just let me clarify something. You don't need helium-3 for fusion, right? We, yeah, we would need helium-3 for fusion. There are other ways of... There are other ways, yeah. There's, you, can, you can use uh, deuterium for a fusion reaction, but then it's not that powerful compared to helium-3, in a sense. And there's some problem with... Um, well, it's kind of hard to explain, but I'll try to um, communicate it with you. But deuterium, when using two deuterium atoms to fuse them, there's actually a neutron which is released. And they have problems containing that neutron, which, and that's why fusion reaction is really impossible without using, I mean, helium-3. So. All right. Can you think of any unintended consequences of mining the moon? Uh, positive consequences? for uh, the Well, Earth? possibly not. Possibly not? OK. Uh, I mean, yeah, we, we are exploiting, I guess, the moon. I, I agree with that completely. But it's helping the Earth in a sense. You know, I mean, where we live, it's kind of a selfish thing, but it is. I mean, you know, because. We are exploring the moon, but in result, we're receiving a world where it's clean, you know, where we, where we have no fear anymore of pollution or global warming. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah. If you were to discover um, unforeseen resources of helium-3 under the Antarctic, do you think we should mine there? Hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think we should, because, I mean, still, OK, we might be exploiting one region of the Earth, but in return to that, we're seeing a world just completely without pollution, without global warming. It's, it's affecting the whole world globally. You know, with, yeah, surely we're exploiting some parts, but if you weigh the consequences, I mean, it's, yeah, it's kind of, it's easy to decide in a sense, yeah. Fair enough, yeah. thank you.